Hello, everyone. My name is Ian McLaughlin, and I have a PhD in neuroscience. And mostly thanks to my mom, one of the first like serious scientific topics that I explored in like a serious way, uh, well, as serious as you know, tiny little fledgling human can, was evolution. Um, and I always describe the research that I did as focusing on the neurobiology of mood, anxiety, and addiction. Um, but if I'm being completely honest, the real inspiration for my research was understanding the evolutionary history of a particular circuit in the brain that's been in an animal of some sort on Earth for at least 350 million years, the medial abenula interpeduncular nucleus axis, which you can see right here. So, so this is a circuit right in the middle of your brain. Um, and it's critical to how it is that activity in the front of your brain is able to influence the middle and the back of your brain. And so do you see that lovely sort of teal colored egg thingy with like a thick line going up diagonally from it? That's the circuit. And uh, this is a picture I took with a microscope that took an embarrassingly uh, long time to take. But the point is that essentially every animal, certainly every mammal with whom you interact or can even name, has that same exact circuit with some slight differences, but they look almost exactly the same. So that's what I was studying. Um, you know, I was essentially studying a short chapter in the book of human evolution. Um, and so, you know, the reality is that essentially every discipline in biology shares quite a few underlying motivations and goals and techniques and, and so on. But ultimately, they have at least one thing in common. If you're interrogating biology in a serious way, what you're also doing is adding chapters to the story of human evolution. And so today, we are very fortunate to be joined by um, a rising scientist about to finish their PhD at the University of Michigan, one of the top research institutions in the world, by the way, particularly for evolutionary biology, the soon-to-be Georgia Oteri. So here is Georgia. Thank you, Ian. Soon-to-be Dr. Georgia Oteri. I am Georgia Oteri <laughs> now, as far, as far as I know, unless you know something. <laughs> right. But yeah, thank um, you so, so much for that introduction. It's great. It's interesting hearing about, like, what specific like what specifically in the brain you're interested in um but yeah mm -hmm. as you mentioned i uh, study evolution i'm a wildlife biologist so usually i study evolution in non-human animals um i primarily study bats and while we're on the topic of uh bats they have actually quite small brains compared to other mammals because you know they have to cut down on weight because they're flying around but um but yeah it's cool to get to talk about about other mammals and also sort of a, a larger evolutionary time scale than I normally think of. I look a lot at sort of very like short term um, evolution in that like the type of stuff that we can see, how we can see species genetics changing like within a human lifetime, for example. So it's cool to get to zoom out sometimes and think about these like bigger evolutionary pictures and how did we as a human species come to exist. Couldn't agree more. Um, and so we have somebody who, who works in evolution and we're gonna have a conversation about a recent finding of a wonderfully intact skull um, that has informally been dubbed Dragon Man. <laughs> but we're also gonna have a conversation about how we can think about this new finding, uh, You know what it can teach us about our own story, but then also a broader conversation about human evolution. And so before we get too far into our topics, I have a question for anyone who might be watching. You know, um, why do you think humans live as long as we do? Obviously today, you know, we have access to medicine and, and nutrition, but, but even our primitive ancestors lived quite a long time relative to other primates, uh, well beyond our reproductive age, right? So why do you think that might be? We'll get into that in, in a little bit. Okay, so Dragon Man. So there was this recent discovery of, of an absolutely beautiful specimen in China um, of this skull that, that certainly seems to have added a few paragraphs, at least, to the story of human evolution. And again, it's, it's informally dubbed the Dragon Man, not because they looked like a dragon or anything like that, just because it was discovered near the Dragon River uh, region of north, northeast China. But let's be honest, it's, it is good marketing by the scientists who found it. <laughs> so um, discovered hominins like regularly get nicknames, by the way. You know, we have Lucy, we have Artie, we have Narikatami Boy. Uh, the Tong Child, um, and you know, they're either just friendly nicknames um, or they're named after uh, where they were found. And hey, Scott, thank you all so much for for joining. Hey, Lucia, awesome to see you. Thank you for the award, Lisa and Lucia. Thank you, um, and thank you, David and, and Christian. Lovely to see you here. Um, yeah, hello, okay. everybody. It's good to see you. Yeah. So, and actually, like speaking of these like other cool fossils, so this Dragon Man skull. It's also called the the Harbin fossil. It's another name for it, I guess. 
Um, but this dragon man skull, he was found in 1933 by someone. And that was actually, it was not that long after, I guess, the uh, Peking man in China was found. So apparently, like people, if, you've, if you're familiar at all with this dragon man skull, like the stories that have been in the news about it, um, this Chinese man found it when he was working, I think, in construction. Um, and he hid it in a well because he was working for the Japanese who occupied China at the time. And he didn't want to like hand it over to his Japanese boss. But apparently because like Peking man had just been discovered, you know, not that long before he already, he had it in his mind, like, wow, this is something important. And uh, because he had heard about Peking man and he kind of, that, that probably fed into, you know, his thinking and realizing the importance of this and, and deciding to hide it. Yeah, yeah, it's a harrowing story. Um, so, so George and I have a lot for you today, um, including everything from from stories of, of many of the ancestors that led up to who we are today, why Homo sapiens evolved the way we have with this, our big old fancy brains, as well as, as some of the most critical aspects of our biology that are likely derived from viruses. We may not get to that, but, uh, but we'll do our best. So, so let's get to it. So, um, uh, okay, let's do this. I thought it might help to sort of set the stage at the beginning. Right. One of the questions that I've encountered, you know, every now and then and, and certainly wondered myself has been what came before the apes. Right. Like we certainly evolved from other apes over millions of years. Right. But what led up to the apes? Well, one of the leading theories um, to uh, where are we? Where are we? Oh, I thought I had you up here. Um, shoot. Oh, well, the good so, news so one is, of the is that we theory. have a lot of photos and media to share with you all. But the bad news is, is it's hard to, to find it all because there's so much to scroll talk. through. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So one of the here we go. I think I just got it. Uh, gosh, this is unfortunate. Can we try one um, more time? Well, I'll just continue, I guess, the story real quick while you're looking for that about the guy who found it. Because I kind of left off, oh, it was discovered in 1933, but we're just now hearing about it, right? So so why is that? Well, the guy hid it for a long time. He didn't even tell his family. Um, so it was only in like a few years ago that I guess scientists kind of be um, were made aware of this skull and, and anyone else besides the guy, I guess. So um, And so then they've been analyzing it supposedly for the past couple years to see what it could add to, what paragraphs, as Ian mentioned, it could add to what we know of human evolution. Um, did you find our great ape? Yeah. Yes. The great great yeah, ancestors. So, so one of the leading theories is that we likely emerged from like a thing that looked kind of like a rat or a shrew or like a squirrel looking type of critter. And um, that those critters would have been called purgatorious. So, so purgatorious is a genus of, of seven uh, extinct species that um, are ultimately thought to be like ground zero of what ultimately became primates. Um, and the first evidence of Purgatorius was found in Montana in 1965 at a place called Purgatory Hill, uh, a very inviting name for a hill. Kind of reminds me of the Dismal Swamp in New Jersey, if you've ever heard of that place. Clearly didn't have the best real estate marketing instincts back then, but it was found in deposits that have been dated to 63 million years, uh, million years old, of course. And so it goes back away. But as you can tell, it basically looks like a mouse or a squirrel. And based on its anatomy, it spent quite a, a fair bit of its time in trees. And so how do we know that it was likely one of our earliest ancestors? Well, if you look at its jaws and its teeth, very important part of trying to figure out this story, and importantly, the bones of the feet and ankles, they look quite a bit more like later primates than other animals who were scampering around all those millions of years ago. But if like one were to walk by you right now, you obviously wouldn't instinctively think like, oh, there goes something that will evolve, right? <laughs> Over millions of years into a primate. You know, it doesn't have our, our handy forward facing eyes giving us binocular vision and it has claws instead of nails um, like, like we have and, and our closest relatives have. Um, and so it's called um, a plesiodapiform, okay? A, sort of, a group of sort of primates uh, as far as I'm aware, and it, it's still sort of a debate as to in evolutionary biology as to whether they're technically primates. But fundamental to all of these discoveries um, and comparisons is looking for what are called synaptomorphies. Um, and I promise I'll minimize the jargon as much uh, as I can moving forward. But they're really just traits that are shared by two or more groups, right, that, that are inherited from a common ancestor. The more closely related two groups of animals are, the more of these synaptomorphies they'll share. So for Homo sapiens, They'll have opposable thumbs, nails instead of claws, forward-facing eyes. They'll be bipedal, things like that. Um, think about how you can sort of tell if 
you know, siblings are related by just looking at them, right? Um, right, it's same kind of thing, right? And obviously this is easier when you're looking at twins, like Issa Beta, Beta Bug or Issa Betancourt, an entomologist who you should all follow if you don't already, and her twin sister. But if you look at you know siblings and parents from a family overall, you can sort of detect shared traits. And so a similar process is going on when biologists are weaving together the sort of tapestry of our evolutionary history, right? And that's the struggle when it comes to purgatorius, right? It doesn't have those front-facing eyes enclosed in bone like we have uh, and that we're all taking for granted right now. Um, but those traits had to come from somewhere, right? So purgatorius. Yeah. That's a cute little, a cute little animal. So like, mm -hmm. so that I think like yeah, that should hopefully be intuitive to people. There's like Ian threw out some fancy words there, but basically these fancy words all just mean that we're like looking for similarities and trying to see, like basically what makes the most sense in terms of what's related to what what's based on our observations. Just the simplest story. Oh, these two people look very similar because they are related to each other very recently. Um, but there are some differences that the. the um, the metaphor of like pe like our family, like pedigree type of relationships can only go so far for evolutionary relationships because evolutionary like, you know, splitting of species is, is not as clear cut as um, a parent having two different kids, for example. And that's because with populations, when with evolution, we're looking at populations of things and species. And so we can have different levels of separation that occur, different levels of like interbreeding between the populations happening. Um, and so when we think about, when we think about like human evolution, um, let's see, let me just show this image now. Um, let me highlight it. Yeah, so, ooh, we went away. So this image is kind of like shows um, humans are on the far left. It's sort of like an evolutionary tree, right? Humans on the far left, and then close to us, there's Neanderthals, and then we have Denisovians nearby. And we see that these are like three different groups splitting off, but there's also these black arrows going across the top of the page between them. And those black arrows are showing that there's some interbreeding happening. So that's um, that interbreeding is is kind of the main difference where we see that um, that like you know pedigrees are not the same exactly as the types of things we're thinking about in evolutionary biology. Oh, there we go. Why? <laughs> Why are we okay. like this? This is not intuitive. Okay. There we go. We got it. All right. So so yeah, exactly. And, and it gets complicated, right? Right. When, when it comes to um, to hominins, but so so. So that lovely little critter, right, was, was likely one of our early ancestors, living mostly in trees and, you know, having some of the ingredients that may have enabled for the evolution of the traits that make a human a human. But the discovery of the dragon man's skull isn't filling chapters of evolution dating back 65 million years, right? We're talking about about around 140,000 years, and just under 300,000 years ago. So a very, very long time ago, but far more recent than, you know, when our ancestors were like scampering, you know, around trees on all fours. And so, so yeah, so as, as Georgia noted, this was a discovery in, in Harbin, right? Um, and this group came out with, here, we, I'll do it this way too. This group came out with um, two publications, uh, or I'm sorry, three publications, two of which I have here. Um, and the group published um, these three papers in a journal called The, the Innovation. It's a new journal, about a year old. Um, and, you know, these are the titles, just two of them. And the, the group makes a pretty big claim. Right. They claim that the skull of this, it, it, this is the skull of a new species, right, which they call Homo longi, right, and long, that just basically means dragon in, in Mandarin, evidently. Um, I believe long skull, means dragon, yeah. Yeah, long, right. And the, the skull was discovered, you know, in the Dragon River area, right. Um, and so, so that's their claim. But the field hasn't necessarily agreed with their argument. And I know Georgia has a couple of thoughts on this. Well, and not even that the field doesn't necessarily agree, but there's also some disagreement among the co-authors, as we found. Um, but yeah, I mean, so basically, here's what people do agree on. They agree, the scientists agree that the skull is cool because it's so intact. Normally, um, normally it's, it's very unusual to find like an, just a well-preserved skull like that. And it's an intact skull that's different than any other intact skulls we have. Um, so that's definitely cool. And also all the scientists agree that it's a skull of 
um, some humanoid hominin species that's in the genus Homo, the same genus that we are in, Homo sapiens. So, so that in itself makes it a really, really cool find and really important to science. Um, but yeah, not everybody agrees that it should be that it should be a new species. Um, and it's mm -hmm. it's hard. It's really hard to make these evolutionary trees when we have bits and fragments of oop, it said connection lost for a second. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, it's hard, it's hard to make these um, evolutionary relationships and even figure out what a species is when we have um, when we have just like just like little bits of bone that we're working on and not really good genetic data. Um, right. And not good genetic and, and or so, morphological data. Yeah. Right. And and so yeah, so the team um what does suggest I see David um brings up a, a good topic that this purported new species that again they're not the entire team as, as Georgia was saying there's some good quotes from uh, a co-author um in London but so so they suggest that this new species would be more closely related to homo sapiens humans than neanderthals right um with whom as Georgia noted uh, humans interbred tens of thousands of years ago but then other paleontologists um you know think that rather than being this a new group of hominins and by the way hominins basically just refers to any member of the tribe hominini uh, or hominini um so and we're the only living hominin uh, but includes everything from Neanderthals, uh, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, uh, the Australopithecines. And so basically you can think of a hominin as like anything that's more closely related to us than chimps or like bonobos. Um, and so so what does it take to be a part of this exclusive club of, of mammals? Um, two sort of major things, and please, Georgia, um, correct me if, if I'm off here, but typically bipedal. And um, one that may be a little bit less intuitive, but the size of canine teeth are about the same size as between males and females. Um, and so here is a, an example of why we why those those criteria are used. You know, if you look at chimp canine teeth, they're pretty ferocious, right? Look at that. Um, and if you compare a male chimp to a female chimp, there's a pretty significant difference in their canine size. But if you compare you know, my teeth to my wife's, my wife's teeth, uh, canine teeth, they're about the same. Um, and so that is sort of one of the characteristic features of, of being a hominin. Um, so. Yeah, so so the um, question of is it, it's, is, is it its own species or not? And then is it close, our closest relative closer to us than Neanderthals or not? Those are kind of the two really big claims that are that are up for debate, yeah. Um, and, and like I mentioned, yeah, like not all of the authors even agree on, on, on both of those things. So, um, we had a, a question earlier from Christian about, um, about the relationship in this chart that I showed. And yeah, so it's, I mean, it's presumed that Neanderthals are close, more closely related to humans and, um, and then in this, like Neanderthals and Denisovians are also very closely related. Um, we do have evidence of Denisovian and Neanderthal DNA in us, in Homo sapiens. Um, but there's, for example, one of the things that there's disagreement among scientists about is whether or not, um, whether or not D Denisovians are even all one species. And so when that debate already exists, okay, it, the, the question of whether this dragon man is, is or is not a Denisovian, I mean, maybe he's one of many species that we call Denisovians. Um, the, the only evidence we have of Denisovians is, um, the, only, the only fossil evidence actually is a mandible bone, so like part of the jaw, and um, I think some teeth and a finger, basically very tiny, tiny little pieces. And so it's, you can see why it would be a really big claim then to say that this skull is is definitely not a Denisovian. Right. So, um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, these things are regularly, you know, things like this are regularly in science, right? Um, that's the nice thing about science is the, the more information we get, the the more precise we can get. But so, so I, you know, I thought it might be fun to explore our family tree a bit. And I know Georgia uh, most definitely has thoughts about how useful focusing on trees as a metaphor really is. But I thought it might be fun to go through the story of how humans became humans over the course of many millions of years and a whole ton of different hominins. We won't spend too much time on it, but, and it's still being established, of course. 
but they're pretty much three contenders for the earliest hominins who walked around doing hominin things. And so one is Chadensis, uh, Chad, the Chad hominin, really just because this Chadensis was discovered in, in Chad, the country of Chad. Um, and so Chadensis would have been around 7 million years old uh, for whom we have skulls. And then there's Aurorin Tugenensis, right, around 6 million years old. Um, and I've only seen pictures of like a leg bone and a vertebra or something like that, you know, as Georgia was, was describing. And then there's Artipith Artipithecus Kadaba, which would have been between 5.8 and 5.2 million years old. So think about a million years. Um, and I haven't seen any fossils um, of that early hominin. But just from Chadensis, you can see that, you know, these hominins are still looking kind of apey, right? They have these this big protruding face, big old beetle brow big old mouth, right? Um, you know, not looking exactly like a homo sapien or our close hominin relatives. Um, and then after Chadens, this in that group, we have um, Artipithecus rambus. And uh, here we are. Okay, so Artipithecus rambus uh, would have walked around the earth around 4.2 million years ago, around Ethiopia, or at least that's where the, the, the a partial skeleton was found. Um, now, what's really interesting about these remains of, you know, Ramidus, uh, nicknamed Artie, by the way, was that she was pretty small, you know, a, about over 1.2 meters tall, so pretty small, and it looked like she lived in a woody, wooded, you know, environment with trees. But what's really interesting about um, Ramidus were her feet, Artie's feet. So she had an opposable toe, like modern apes have, right, helping them to, to be expert climbers, right? But the rest of her foot wasn't constructed the way that the feet of tree-dwelling apes are constructed, you know, enabling to grasp things with both their hands and feet, almost like their foot is like another hand. Instead, it looked a little bit more like our feet, the feet of a hominid that might be adapted more to walking and maybe running a bit more. She had um, a toe that seemed to maybe be used to sort of propel her. And she also had a pelvis that looked a bit like those that are found in later hominins, like Australopithecus afarensis. That, that bowl shape of, of the pelvis, but the rest of her pelvis looked more like a climbing ape, you know, think like chimpanzee. And so she seems to have been a great example of that transition of being a largely tree dwelling climbing ape to something more like a bipedal hominin, like the ones, you know, you'll, you'll be seeing in some of the upcoming pictures. Um, and so let's see if I have those ready to go. Um, and phylogeny. Oh, you know what? I guess we could just use, just use this one, I guess. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Georgia. Oh, no, no. I just, I was just remembering that picture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, an, I have another one, too, that I actually meant to also um, to use because I think it, it's just a little bit easier to, to read. Um, but okay. we will get to that one as well. Boom. And... So, okay. Okay. So, so after those ancient hominins, right? Those three that we talked about, um, we begin to see younger hominins, or you know, younger, you know, four million years ago, <laughs> you know, like um, Australopithecus anamensis, afarensis, around four million years ago, right? Um, and you know, we have more sort of fossil evidence for these folks, these hominins. Um, and so, for example, we have. Gosh, this is much more difficult to juggle than I thought it was going to be. We have a lot of pictures. Um, and so this is the infamous Lucy. Okay. So um, that's uh, afarensis. Um, and so it, when we also have anamensis, I'm sorry. Okay. So these are two um, astralopithecines. Um, and so the, the darker colored skull is Lucy. Okay. And so, so definitely beginning to look quite a bit more like a human right, than the ancient ancestors like Chadensis from, you know, millions and millions of years ago, right? Um, and so this is already the case, you know, their skulls were already beginning to look more like Homo sapien, um, you know, four million years ago. So, you know, th that was already happening, um, even that far back, right? And, um, and though, what, what's, what's interesting about understanding these, a these ancient hominins is that they were thought to spend a fair bit of time both climbing as well as being bipedal, right? So th that transition was beginning to happen. Um, and then, you know, we, we begin to get to some of the more familiar hominins, right? Like uh, Neanderthals and um, uh, 
uh, in this one, right? Neanderthals, uh, you know, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, Heidelbergensis. Um, and then we begin to see Homo sapiens only about 300,000 years ago. So pretty recently, if you think about it, right? And as you can see in this chart, there's a fair bit of overlap, right? So this is going through time um, from one side to the other, right? And you can see that there's a fair bit of overlap between the various hominids, including multiple members of the genus Homo, right? And I want to, I want to bring your attention to one of those names in particular, the Denisovians. Um, and so as you can see, it overlaps almost perfectly with Neanderthals, Heidelborgensis, um, another hominin, and Homo sapiens. And you can see where that little blue dot is labeled uh, Homo longi. That's where this group of paleontologists are suggesting that they'd add dragon man to this family tree, um, that this is a distinct group of hominins. It's not a Neanderthal or a Denisovan or Denis uh, Denisovian. Um, and they suggest it's even more closely related to Homo sapiens than either of them. But there is that debate as to whether or not this is actually a distinct hominin. Um, and the scientists themselves acknowledge that, that it very well could have been a Denisovian, right? You know, much like Neanderthals, living humans have, have some Denisovian genes in our genomes. Um, it seems like most of us are probably more closely related to Neanderthals than Denisovians. Um, but, you know, we, we have that genetic heritage. And, um, you know, regardless of whether Dragon Man is truly a new hominin, Homo longi, or if it's a Denisovian, it's a remarkable discovery because either way, to date, the only fossils of Denisovians have been the, you know, like a pinky bone, some teeth, and a shard of skull that were discovered in the Denisova cave in um, Siberia. Um, and so, so this could be, whether it's Homo longi or if it's an intact Denisovian skull, it's massive. It's a massive discovery. Um, okay, so that that's a little bit of our sort of, you know, our, our family tree. Well, so, so um, uh, Georgia, how do you feel about the use of, of the family tree as the metaphor? I could, I could tell you were scared to, to use that again. I mean, I think it's, I think it's fine. I think it's a great metaphor to use. I think it's just important when we're talking about it kind of in depth like this to sort of delineate, delineate like the boundaries of how far you can take the metaphor, right? All metaphors are, you know, sort of half lies in that they only, they only work so far. So, um, but yeah, I mean, we saw in that in that little thing that you just showed that there's, um, you know, the overlap in time, like each of those, you know, like time is kind of marching along as you move horizontally in that in that figure that you showed. Um, time is marching along vertically in this other picture that you just put up. And so like, you know, you could see that the different species were overlapping, but it didn't tell us anything about their evolutionary relationships to each other in that last image. Um, I guess maybe I could just put it up so it's they're next to each other. Um, but in this other, in this one in the top in the blue, we, we, it looks more like a river, right? And here we're seeing, they're supposed to represent like the, the genetic, like the population, right? And sort of, we see that, you know, populations get bigger and smaller within the same species. And there's also some continuation over time. Um, and I, when I think about evolution in terms of what's happening with the genetics over time. I often think of it more in terms of this sort of river-like image. And so actually I even have, uh, right, like we could put this picture up with a river and we see that with rivers, much like with what actually happens in evolution, things are kind of splitting apart and then maybe parts of it are coming back together. So for example, if we think about how humans have Neanderthal DNA, you know, humans and Neanderthals, were, you know, at one point we were separate species that had kind of split apart, but there was some interbreeding. I for, I'm not sure when it happened. Maybe there was like a split and then interbreeding later, or maybe there was kind of always some interbreeding. But either way, that's kind of like you can look in the river and you see how channels split apart, but then other like little sub channels come back over. And that those, that water kind of coming back over into the Homo sapiens, for example, that would, that's uh, the, the, genetic example of that would be that some of those genes that are only in the Neanderthals before actually come over and get moved into the human population through interbreeding. So if you go on um, like 23andMe or something like that, it'll tell you what portion of your genome is from Neanderthals. And it'll even talk about um, some of the, the physical traits you have that are maybe uh, those genes are originally from Neanderthals. Um, 
Oh, David Howden has a really good question. How are we defining yes. species here? Well, defining species is really, really hard, right? Because when the reality comments. looks like, yeah, when the reality looks like this river instead of a tree, um, you know, it's not as easy as just chopping off branches of a tree and saying, here's one branch, here's another branch, you know, one clean cut, we have our two separate branches we split apart. It, it really is this sort of flowing thing over time. And so when I use species here, I'm mostly just referring to um, the species that, you know, the people who work in this field have sort of decided on, the people who work in this area have decided that uh, right. Neanderthals like, are what, species, yeah. And, and one of the, the classic, you know, simple things, you know, to distinguish species is whether or not they can interbreed, right? If things can't interbreed, then they would be considered different species. But when it comes to hominins, not necessarily the case. So I know like I've, go ahead. Yeah, well, I would I would argue that humans uh, and humanoid and hominins aren't like unique in that I don't think we have more hybridization than, than other mammals per se. I would say like we're studying hominins a lot more closely than we stud, study other mm -hmm. species and kind of like zooming in much more carefully. And that's why we find a lot of hybridization that we don't necessarily pick up in other species. Um, it, it used to be that people, before we had a lot of genetic data, people thought hybridization was extremely rare and didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And as we look, as we get more and more genetic data and start like understanding more and more about evolution, we see that hybridization happens a lot more than people think. Um, we even have, for example, a species of salamander here in Michigan and in other parts of this region of the United States. Um, the salamander can change its ploidy number. So humans are diploid. We get a set of genes from our mom and a set of genes from our dad. These salamanders sometimes have five sets of genes. And the mom will sometimes say, oh, I'm just going to lay some eggs with only like one set of genes and then or, or three sets. And so it's kind of crazy that even something like how many chromosomes a species has can actually just vary tremendously now we're learning. Um, and that's, that's that is a particularly weird case. But now I'm digressing. But the point is that no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, but the, the point is, is that, yeah, a lot of times people think of a definition of species as they can't have hybrids that go on to reproduce. And that definition is, is one that um, is still like often widely used, but especially mm -hmm. when we're zooming in on evolution like this, and we're talking about a period where there was a bunch of different hominin species and not all of them made it it's kind of natural that we would see this kind of messiness in things that we're calling different species. Um, so, so that, that was, I didn't know that about salamanders. I was watching a video of a salamander walking last night, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, they, it is so strange to watch them walk. They, they, they have this like really weird gait. Um, mm. Anyways, I, I know, uh, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah, they, they're very cool. Um, okay, so so um, as we are moving towards um, talking about brains, um, I thought it might be nice to just directly compare on the same screen the skulls of these various hominins, right? And so you can see some comparisons between some of the hominins we've discussed so far. Um, in one, you can see Afarensis and Africanus, uh, those very early hominins from several million years ago. Um, and as you can see, those skulls are still pretty small, right? Still looking a bit more tree-dwelling ape right? And then we move forward and see Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Hyperorgensis, with the skull starting to get both larger and rounder, right? Still having some protruding mouths and stuff like that, but most definitely a larger brain case, which is actually the word that is used. That's the, the, the part of the skull that holds our brains. Uh, one of the rare times where a, a word that's used in science is actually like intelligible. But um, so we're starting to see larger hominids, right? With larger brains. Very cool. And then we end up at Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, the two largest brains among these hominins here, at least, with the Homo sapien brain actually being smaller than the Neanderthal brain. And as we'll explore, the sizes of the brain doesn't necessarily equate to the magnitude of intelligence. Um, and so, let's see, do we have, ah, yes, okay. So this is a fun study that was done. Um, don't worry too much about what all these colors mean. This is a comparison of a reconstruction of what a, the, the Neanderthal brain probably looked like based off of the skulls that were disco uh, discovered, right? Um, and they're comparing it to the brain of a modern human. Um, with, and, and this was uh, done by a group in Japan. And so they'll compare both Neanderthals and modern human brains to those of early human brains. 
And um, so, Ian, all the, these brains look the same to me. Could you could, could you uh, explain yes. like is, are the brains on the yes. top row like the humans or something or? Yes. Um, well, so so not quite. So each no. column is either M H modern human, N T Neanderthal, E H early human, N T Neanderthal, and then M H uh, you know uh, modern human versus early human. Okay. And so you know it worrying about the colors too much is. The, the study is quite a bit more complicated, right? But they basically found that Neanderthal brains, while they were larger, had significantly smaller cerebellums. The part of the brain that's super duper wrinkled, that's like nestled sort of under the much larger cerebrum, uh, it's towards the back of the brain. And so the cerebellum is a very complicated anatomical structure. It's extremely dense and has some unique types of neurons um, that are only found there, are uh, mostly found there. and. Um, but the cerebellum, and it's not one of the, the sexiest parts of the brain to study, if I'm being completely honest, but it has been shown to contribute to a huge variety of human consciousness or, or aspects of human consciousness, everything from mood, language, memory, particularly movement, and particularly when we learn to move. And, um, and so this was just one study that, that was cool that they did this kind of work. And then more recent studies have shown that, oh, whoops. Uh, yeah, so uh, as the brain- a mistake um, on my part. <laughs> Oh yeah, no worries. Um, so it seems to be the case that that the human brain probably takes longer to mature than the Neanderthal brain likely did. Okay, and so why does that matter? What that does is it opens the door to more effective, well, theoretically, to more effectively adapting to novel environments or changing environments. And that's kind of a longer story. And I'm happy to show some of the evidence that that indicates that this might be the case. But one of the things that's both a challenge and an advantage of being human is that it takes quite a while for the human brain to completely mature, to finish maturing. It's, it's not done rapidly growing and changing until we're in our 20s. And so, you know, as a result, there's a long time for the growth of the human brain to be influenced and sculpted by the environment in which it's growing rather than just like finishing growing within five years. And then, you know, the, the human would just be left with what it's got, even if the tribe ends up having to or deciding to migrate out of Africa, right? And so um, that said, so, so, you know, there are definitely some anatomical differences, even just at the gross anatomical level, right? With Neanderthals having bigger brains. I mean, not massively bigger brains, but bigger brains. Um, but when they were first discovered, they were sort of, they sort of got this reputation of being like the classic caveman, right? Like brutish and dumb and violent. Uh, but based on recent reviews of the available evidence of, of what it was like to be a Neanderthal, that just wasn't the case. You know, they worked together, hunting as a group. They likely even herded their prey, um, things like bison, for example, in a way that enabled them to hunt rather effectively, very creative. They likely cooked food, gathered things like peas and acorns, pistachios, pine nuts, right? And there's some evidence that some Neanderthals not necessarily the norm, but some Neanderthals may have even buried their dead, which is a sign of more uh, just a more complex culture or society or potentially even spiritual beliefs. Still definitely disputed as far as I'm aware. Um, so, so, but yeah, that reputation isn't necessarily earned as being these like brutish fools, just sort of like, you know, walking around with clubs in their hands. But yeah, so, it, so this what is, might that... Like it's strange to me though, because I we can see like almost all those behaviors in other animals, right? We have like tool making, we have like herding like, you know, hyenas or something or lions hunting down prey. And we even have, you know, Scott's kind of making fun of elephants and their big brains, but lack of like cultural contributions. I don't know what elephant culture is like, but elephants do have something they call the elephant, uh, the elephant funeral, right? Have you heard of this? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when an elephant, dies they'll like stick around for a day or so even if it's like kind of uh i want to say dangerous to do so but like they're in like a droughted area and stuff and trying to make progress those they'll just kind of stay and like i don't know stroke the dead elephant or its bones or whatever for a while and so it's like oh neanderthals aren't dumb they do all this stuff i mean we consider a lot of other animals dumb that do this stuff so uh, maybe yeah I don't that's know, true and considering them and all so smarter or we <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, and there, there's no doubt that there is a difference. And so what might that difference have been, right? So we know that the Neanderthal body was just generally larger, right? maybe not taller necessarily, but, but just more massive than the Homo sapien body. Um, and with a larger body, 
generally speaking, comes to demand for more just brain real estate that's devoted to things that aren't necessarily directly involved in intelligence, right? Regulating just like simple body regulatory stuff, body temperature, you know, th this kind of thing. And also just controlling all those, that musculature, uh, think elephants. And so, you know, it's possible that while the Neanderthal brain was slightly larger than Homo sapiens, much of that added real estate wasn't really doing the kind of thing that contributes meaningfully to intelligence. But if I had to guess, um, I'd suspect that the Homo sapien brain, while slightly smaller, likely had a larger cortex, thicker cortex, denser cortex relative to that of the Neanderthals. And so generally speaking, and this is an oversimplification, but generally speaking, the secret sauce of the human brain is our, um, is our cortex. And so here we go. And I'm glad that Scott brought up elephants because that's sort of central to this. Um, and so the cortex, I should, I should note, is the outer layer of the brain, the, the sort of the wrinkly part. Um, and it's not like the human brain is the biggest brain in town. Right, not by a long shot. Right, the elephant brain is significantly larger than the human brain. That makes sense. Elephants are impressively large, and and they're pretty intelligent when it comes to animals. But it's a stretch to suggest that elephants are are nearly as intelligent as humans. But if you look at those blue numbers on the the chart on the top, right, you're seeing the numbers of neurons just within the cortex. Okay, and you can see that we have more than twice as many neurons in our cortex relative to the elephant, despite the elephant brain having nearly three times as many neurons. We got and more so, like you know, bang for the buck is what you're saying in terms of our real estate right? space in our brain. And so, yeah, the same relationship between body size and brain size applies here. Of course, that's simpler sort of comparison. The elephant brain is having to regulate this gargantuan body while our brain is actually um, uh, quite large relative to our body size, right? When compared to other animals. Um, and I think you have, yeah. Yeah, I just and so that, yeah, so right. this so, is like that, a chart of like the relative brain size compared to your body size. So elephants are pretty low, actually, right? Mm -hmm. Like they have really big brains, but if you control for how big their whole body is, it's like proportionally like not that big. Um, and humans, we're yeah. at the very we're in the very bottom bar. Um, we're up there, but we're not like the biggest. Um, right. So it's never going to be just like one of these things. But that is definitely a major part of the story. But when we're comparing the brains of Homo sapiens to those of other more recent hominins like Neanderthals or the Dragon Man or Denisovian, uh, whether or not uh, Dragon Man was a Denisovian, those ratios are going to be pretty similar. Right. It's not going to be it's not going to be the same, obviously, but much more similar than you know, human brain to human body versus elephant brain to elephant body. And so there is this strange thing that homo sapiens do um and then here I'll get this thing. okay there's a strange thing that that um, homo sapiens do relative to the rest of the animal kingdom that may give us a hint as to why we have or how these wonderful brains came to be right we live a rather long time and so remember that question i asked at the beginning so of course now right we live quite a long time right but but even thousands of years ago humans could live for for many years after their reproductive age and so, yeah, and I think, you know, yeah, real quick, if please. I could, yeah, I think Christian brought up like a, real, a good point that I think a lot of people would, their minds would jump there in the beginning. He said, you know, oh, we live a long time because we have antibiotics and stuff. Well, like the, the um, average human lifespan has increased with time, has increased with antibiotics and stuff. You're less likely to die early because you're sick or something like that. But actually like the maximum human lifespan hasn't changed that much if i'm i believe that to be correct like yeah yeah you know? th there's like a, a misunderstanding that like humans regularly died you know super super young when uh you know a, a long time ago but that's not that that's a, a sort of oversimplification of um of human lifespan um at, at the time but so so you know if you just step back and think from a strictly evolutionary perspective you know cold hard evolutionary perspective that's kind of odd right theoretically passed your genes on already. Um, you've reached an age where you may not be quite as strong, right? Or you may be susceptible to the decline in various functions like vision, dental health, for sure, bone density, right? These types of things. And so you can't necessarily contribute as much hunting or gathering, right? Or at least just not as much as is in your younger years. And, you know, in fact, as we get older, we, we might begin to cost our tribes more food, more in food than we could help to produce. So, so why would natural selection have selected for shorter lifespans? So, um, so I think Christian also uh, made, had a suggestion uh, that I think speaks to this. So there are a few things, right? 
Um, but, but the two explanations that are the most appealing to me, at least, um, and I think might help elucidate why we have these big family brains. So the first is child rearing, right, as Christian brought up. So just like new families who, you know, today who, who are lucky enough to be close to their grandparents, it's certainly likely that elder members of tribes back then helped to care for children. However, and this is related, um, and this is why I, I, uh, I think it's important for, for understanding the human brain. There's also the fact that elders have amassed quite a bit of wisdom and knowledge over the years, right? And can therefore transfer that information to younger members of the tribe, right? So enabling Homo sapiens to not have to start from scratch every generation, but they could build upon the progress of past generations, right? So the transfer of, inf of information in the form of just demonstration, right? Just like showing, you know, uh, each other uh, before, you know, the emergence of language or spoken word then symbolic representation like art or music, right? And then ultimately writing. And so before you had Wikipedia or, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica, I'm old enough to remember having to use that for school, um, you know, things like that, the best storage mechanism for acquired knowledge was almost certainly older members of tribes, right? And so in its earlier forms, it, you know, was likely quite rudimentary, that transfer of information. But as hominins continue to evolve towards Homo sapien, it seems likely that throughout that process, those homin uh, hominins who, who became better and better at, at doing that, right, particularly as population sizes grew, those hominins would have likely had a dramatic advantage evolutionarily, right? Um, and, so, and so what supports social interaction? The storage of knowledge, communication, and memory, the, our big old brains, that's what, right? And so my money is on the fact that the homo sapien brain benefited from the expansion of our cortex or neocortex um, as well as potentially the lowly cerebellum as we talked about uh, when we compared the homo sapien brain to neanderthal um, well beyond that of other hominins and the reason for that um, or more specifically like why that would be selected by natural selection is still up for debate which would be fine but, but, you know, the likely reason that Homo sapiens are just so unusually versatile and adaptive probably had a lot to do with this expanding neocortex. You know, you have Homo sapiens that have been able to fill niches that extend from like literally spending five minutes, six minutes underwater, free diving at like 80 feet underwater, right, to fish for food many thousands of years ago off the coast of South Africa, and then living in like insane altitudes in Tibet, uh, to living in like literal, just straight up snow, <laughs> relying entirely on the domestication of reindeer, right? To keep from freezing and starving to death. And so, you know, you have the development of complex relationships with unrelated animals, right? Most importantly, in my mind, the horse, uh, but other ones as well. And so that big fancy neocortex enables all kinds of like very complicated integration anatomically. I'm talking from a neurophysiological perspective. The neocortex enables all kinds of really complicated integration of a wide variety of activity throughout the brain, enabling us to come up with complex plans, you know, complex social organizations, divisions of labor, right? Um, you know, and in future plans based on memories from long ago. And so, you know, I suspect that our hominin cousins who were, you know, intelligent for sure, making tools, hunting, you know, uh, hunting and gathering, working together, right? Um, doing you know, things like that. They probably lacked that magical ingredient that the neocortex provides for us due to you know different selective pressures mixed with a different set of random mutations that you know that even enabled the growth of the neocortex to begin with um and i have, I have one last thing on this specific topic uh, to speak to neanderthals versus humans or homo sapiens so we know from a cave in southern germany um, that happened to have been inhabited by neanderthals this was work done by an archaeologist named nick conrad um so it was occupied by neanderthals and then it was abandoned and then subsequently inhabited by Homo sapiens. We know that there is a rather significant difference in the presence of symbolic art, musical instruments, straight up musical instruments, and indications of, of just more abstract cognition, right? Symbolic representation, things like that. So there's something distinct there, meaningfully distinct. And whether it's attributable to the brain alone or to the environment at the different times that the cave was occupied, right? You know, were there tons of predators all over the place when it came, you know, to the Neanderthals, so they just didn't have time? Um, you know, it's hard to tell. Um, but then also the size of the populations, it's another topic we can explore. Um, I haven't seen those answers, but there's definitely evidence for a difference in higher order cognition and communication. And it's definitely reasonable to suspect that there is a meaningful anatomical and functional difference between these two hominins' brains, 
right, that contributed um, to those differences in what our ancestors left behind. So, so yes, I agree. I, I, um, I find that the sort of noble savage argument that some folks make about, you know, Neanderthals or, or just other hominins to be, I understand where it's coming from, but there's just evidence that there even all, you know, many, those many, many thousands of years ago, there was a, already a significant difference. Yeah, that's really interesting. And just like for this, so for this dragon man brain, for example, like a lot was made in the media of, it has a similar size brain as us. And we like, yeah, we killed off this like other intelligent species. Like, or I mean, of course it was probably an intelligent species, but you know what I mean? Like maybe even smarter than we were or something like that. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, just, yeah, you'd have to be like careful with media stuff like that. And I mean, so their brains, I thought it was interesting. So like their brains of, of Dragon Man is like basically kind of like shorter and longer than ours. And like ours are like the same volume, but like rounder. Is well, so so that, that's, yeah, exactly. That, that's almost always the case where like humans okay. have the, this unusually round brain case. Um, is and, that because and, of the uh, cerebellum I, or in part? Well, I mean, it's, it's probably a bunch of different things, right? But, mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, yeah, so, so I, if I recall correctly, I think Dragon Man would have technically had something like uh, potentially 7% larger brain, but Neanderthals also had larger brains. Right. So certainly, you know, as we've been sort of harping on here, larger brains do not mean more intelligent. Um, and, you know, brain size does correlate with intelligence. Don't get me wrong. Right. You have to have enough brain real estate to, to support intelligence, but it's more about the connectivity. Right. It's more about how the brain is organized. Um, and, and, you know, I, I don't want to disrespect the, our Neanderthal cousins uh, too much. Right. It is worth keeping in mind that they were a really seriously successful hominid. Right, they they'd been around for a very seriously long time when we Homo sapiens barged into their neighborhoods, um, and so you know they, they weren't just like goofball cavemen, right, grunting at each other. They were very successful. They were around for hundreds of thousands of years, but there was something uh, unique, something uh, special to um, well, I would argue the human brain, uh, at least a big part of what made uh, Homo sapiens special, uh, that that enabled us to outcompete. Well, I've heard that a lot of it too was like the climate changing, right? Like they were better adapted mm -hmm. for these like really cold environments. And then you have, you know, massive scale climate change with, you know, historical climate, ancient climate change with glaciers retreating and um, they just, mm -hmm. their habitat that they were the best at surviving in compared to us was going away mm -hmm. too at the same time, possibly. Yeah. And, and we know that the point at which Homo sapiens arrived to where Neanderthals were sort of, um, were, were, you know, their neighborhood, there was a, a pretty significant difference just in weaponry. So we know that Neanderthals, very, very strong hominins, right? And they essentially exclusively relied on thrusting spheres, uh, which takes a lot of muscular power to be able to even pull off. But uh, Homo sapiens already had projectiles, right? They already had throwing spears, bows and arrows already. Um, and so that already is just this dramatic mismatch in, um, in capabilities. Um, and so, yeah, what, one, uh, another thing that, that I would um, highlight, right, among plenty of other theories that, that we're not going to um, talk about is the role of population sizes, um, the role that population size plays on the output of signs of higher order intelligence, like, like art, tools, these types of things. Um, early Homo sapiens very often left traces of their presence in the forms of things like that, right? But this was particularly the case when there were signs that tribes seem to have reached a certain population threshold, right? So once a population reaches, I mean, I'm talking about literal numbers of people within the tribe. And so once, once a population reaches a certain threshold, there tends to be an explosion in these kinds of things, these, these you know, artifacts of intelligence. And so another reason that the human brain may have been able to continue expanding is because of just simpler advantages that enable populations to, to reach a certain size, Right, enabling Homo sapiens who had been born with maybe just a slightly large, well, not Homo sapiens, but you know our ancestors with just a slightly larger cortex, but because they had enough people doing enough things, taking care of enough of the the job of surviving, right, that those those our ancestors who had just a slightly larger cortex would actually be able to exploit that newly enlarged cortex, right? If if we didn't have if that hadn't happened, then it wouldn't have mattered whether or not you know Homo sapiens had this fancy cortex. 
Yeah, but I wonder too, like even if you have a, some hypothetical population where everyone is exactly the same level of intelligence, maybe once you get a certain mm -hmm. amount, number of people, it allows for like the degree of specialization in jobs you need where like people can mm -hmm. focus on what their interests are or just it's like more efficient as a society and it frees up like time or something. I mean, you know, very yeah. hypothetically, maybe now you're like your encampment is big enough that like you don't like the wolves or whatever are scared away from it and you don't have to like spend as much time patrolling. Um, so yeah, I think that, and I mean, we shouldn't ignore either. Like there's, we don't just have genetic evolution. We have cultural transmission, mm -hmm. like just because our language is, is complex enough that even in lack of sort of like genetic adaptation, if someone comes up with a good idea and it spreads through the group, right? So if you have That's more that. people to some degree, you are going to be better able to take advantage of like those rare, really good ideas that it just takes maybe not even higher intelligence, but just chance for someone to come up with a really mm -hmm. good idea. Yeah. To, to store knowledge, right? Another mm -hmm. that that's the whole argument behind why it, it's really nice to have elders around because they are the sort of banks of information. Right. And then, yeah, divisions of labor. Exactly. Right. More time on your hands. But then also importantly, when you reach that that number, that population threshold, social interaction becomes even more critical, right? We have essentially a primitive form of politics, but but beyond just politics, just like more complex social relationships, where instead of just managing your direct familial relationships, right, your siblings, your parents, whatever, your kids, you had cousins and nephews and nieces and aunts and uncles, and you know, the, those types of extended relationships. And, and these are relationships about which you care deeply inherently. Um, and, you know, and that's true throughout the entire animal kingdom, right? Like you can see a, a sort of preferential positive treatment of familial relationships. But when you have this big tribe, you have extended relationships that you all, you have to juggle in your mind. You have to keep those um, relationships in, in mind. And, and so now the complexity at that population threshold is, is ballooning quite a bit. And so as a result, a hominin who could juggle right, all of those complicated and intricate relationships would likely have had an advantage when it came to ensuring that their genes are passed on through the generations, right? And there's, there's a bunch of other theories, like one of the most important ones um, that's been around for a while is the emergence of food preparation and particularly cooking with heat. Um, that's certainly one of the more compelling ones, right? Which basically in short makes, you know, having a, a profoundly expensive organ, right? To have our brain quite a bit less expensive, right? Food preparation. Um, and so, so yeah, so th those are some of the, the arguments to explain why it is that homo sapien brains were so different relative to our hominins. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip the uh, paleo virology story just because we've already been going on for a while. I'm so um, curious to see what that would be, but- uh, Well, so let, let me give you- we come back to it maybe. Yeah, maybe. Well, here, okay, here's just a, a little part of it. So it turns out there's evidence that the emergence of the placenta, right? So this is going way back, you know, much further than, or far, you know, further than- uh, Oh, you mean like when animals. placental mammals became a thing? Like, exactly, right? There's evidence that the only way that that could have possibly emerged is because of an ancient infection by a retrovirus of some sort. A retrovirus is a virus that's capable of integrating into the genome of its host cell, so it becomes part of the genome. So an infection by a retrovirus of a germ cell, sperm or egg, that enabled the that the resulting embryo to generate this viral protein on the placenta, or on what ultimately became the placenta, enabling the placenta to interact with the embryo itself, but then also you know the the thing that ultimately became the, the womb. <laughs> um, so yeah, pretty critical evolutionary moment, um, and uh, might have been derived from viruses. But um, Wait, okay. sorry, I, I miss, I got confused. Do we have the placenta because the virus like wants us to have the placenta or to protect our, the baby from the virus somehow? So um, so it, it's not that that like the virus, you know, obviously the virus, and, and I, I know you know this, but um, the virus doesn't want anything, right? Wait, this, it's, this it's, is what, it, what the air quotes are for. Yeah. yeah but, oh, yeah, gotcha. Continue. Okay, I meant that. Um, so so it, it basically injected, inserted the sequence, the genetic sequence to encode for a protein, just a protein that is part, one of the virus's proteins that the virus would encode to make. But because it had infected a germ cell, now those cells were capable of making that viral protein. But it just so happened that, that because of where it was inserted in the genome, that viral protein was expressed 
but it was expressed in a way that enabled for the placenta essentially to function, right? To protect the developing organism uh, or developing fetus from the host immune system, from the mother's immune system. Um, and so it's just sort of like this handy thing that we happen, we, that our ancient, ancient, ancient ancestors happened to pick up because of this, just by chance, viral infection of germ cells. Um, it's a protein, if anybody's interested in looking into this, I'm happy to like do this topic, but it's a protein called syncytin or syncytin or syncytin, I've heard it pronounced a bunch of different ways, but um, yeah, syn syncytin is how I like to, to pronounce it. But yeah, syncytin, it, because if you look at the, sequ the genetic sequence for syncytin, it looks a lot like a viral sequence, it does not look a lot like other sort of the typical organisms that, that animals that were around at the time. Um, so yeah, okay, we ended up doing that for longer than I thought. Uh, and uh, you know, since I didn't, you know, the spike protein on COVID or in SARS coronavirus two, SARS CoV two, the spike protein that's the thing that enables it to infect cells. Same kind of protein for this ancient retrovirus, right? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, that is just one of my uh, one of my little hobby topics. But okay, so what can we learn about ourselves from this discovery of dragon? So, so first, you know, it is unclear as to whether or not this skull belongs to a new type of hominin. It's going to take other groups scrutinizing the skull using other methods, perhaps even um, harvesting a bit of DNA, right? Because uh, you know, perhaps finding more remains that that really, um, you know, to really come to a conclusion on that specific question. And the team hasn't started trying to extract DNA from certain parts of the skull. The hardest part is usually where they get DNA, um, or from teeth. That that's another classic um, place to, to harvest DNA to to explore this dragon man's genome. Um, but that would give us a much clearer picture. But we can tell that, you know, whoever this hominin was, it had a pretty substantial brain pan, right? As we were saying, the scientists claim, yeah, it was about 7% bigger. Um, we also know that Dragon Man was walking around, right? Hominin evolution was a, a far more dynamic uh, landscape at, at the time. Uh, you know, there was some overlap. We weren't the only game in town, far from it, right? There were other hominins walking around, sometimes breeding with Homo sapiens. And we know that all of us have at least a bit of Neanderthal DNA, and it varies depending on a person's you know, unique background, but around 2% of our genome is derived from Neanderthals. And it's not like that DNA is just sitting there doing nothing, right? As Georgia was, was naming um, uh, or, or was enumerating, it seems to influence things like our cardiovascular system, hair and eye color. And this, there's a recent study um, that suggested that folks who've inherited a particular gene from Neanderthals may have offered some protection against severely reacting to COVID-19. Mm. It's pretty cool. Um, and so we know that we also have, you know, um, some of the genes from uh, Denisovians. Um, and so, so, so you know, we can learn at least that much about ourselves from uh, this new discovery. Um, and so, um, yeah, there, there's, there, there's, a, there's more. Um, I, you know, I, I've been going on for a while. Was there something that you wanted to uh, bring up, Georgia? Oh, well, I was just going to say, I mean, given that the, the actual evidence that we have of like early human evolution is so patchy, I mean, I'll just be honest. I mean, all the points you brought up are good, right? But honestly, it is really hard to say that much that's really clear cut and meaningful just from one more skull. Like, it's really important. It's another like piece of the puzzle, but we're definitely still as scientists, like the scientists are still putting together that that puzzle. And so, but so what, what are you referring to specifically? Um, I just mean in terms of like, like tangible things, like you talk about like a lot about like the Neanderthals and like what genes they might've contributed. Like we, it's hard to say sort of concrete things yet from the skull we found, right? Like they haven't done oh, like yeah. genomic stuff with it. Like we don't have that yeah, many that, others. Maybe if we find more Denisovian skulls, then we'll be able to say more like whether it is or is not a Denisovian or something different or whether Denisovians are all the same thing. So like the, unfortunately, like because all the skull data is so like, that there's so few fossils, um, especially when you sort of like zoom into like very close human relatives, homo, homo sapien relatives that like, it's it's really, oh, it's so amazing to have like a skull that's like so complete, um, except for his teeth, which is weird because often the teeth are like the only thing you find, but the skull minus teeth, that's very complete. Um, I think I think like the genetic work will will be really cool to look at and see when they exactly when yeah yeah that, that's what I was you yeah. know saying until yeah, yeah. that sequencing is done you know we're not going to really come to a conclusive answer right um, okay so so another thing that um, that has sort of I think been internalized uh, by a lot of people is what has come to be called the killer ape theory 
Okay. And so um, some of the evidence uh, that, that has been collected has helped us to understand that, you know, so, so it's, it's this internalized concept that, that uh, of early hominins that our ancestors were fundamentally warlike and violent. Um, and there's some evidence to suggest that that's at least somewhat misguided. So, you know, again, this is called the violent ape or the killer ape theory. And this was based off of, um, here we go. This is based off of a, a discovery of a skull cap of a young hominin, uh, Paranthropus robustus. Um, and so um, that was found in a cave in South Africa. And so you can see what looked like those two little punctures on the skull. And those punctures were interpreted as being the injuries of violent clashes between other hominins who were using weapons. Okay. And so, um, you know, one of the earlier models began to be that, that early hominins were warlike and violent, right? But there's more to the story. So subsequently, another scientist, uh, Sherwood Washburn, uh, he noted that predators in general in that area seem to consume their prey in ways that look a lot like the injuries that are seen in this skull and other skulls that were found nearby, right? And so Washburn's argument, um, and I love the, the name Sherwood, it's like Sherwood Washburn, it's like so, such a classic name. So, you know, rather than being the byproduct of, of violent clashes between other hominins, instead, it may just have been that these early hominins were actually the victims of nearby predators. And so in other words, we weren't always, we weren't necessarily the inheritors or we aren't the inheritors of, of like violent clashes between hominins alone, right? We're actually inheriting the legacy of hominins who struggled to avoid being prey, or at least that's what Washburn would argue. You know, we're not necessarily the byproduct of hominins who were inherently driven to fight one another, right? We're the byproduct of hominins who had to learn to, to work together to survive, right? And hunt and reproduce uh, and, you know, work collabor collab collaboratively to avoid being devoured by predators that were stronger, faster, and larger. And in this case, in, you know, including gigantic birds, <laughs> which is what uh, some of the more recent an, uh, analyses of, of this skull cap suggest were, were, this, were the cause of this, uh, the, the skull punctures. I mean, can you imagine having to like avoid gigantic birds that would attack you and kill your children? Uh, pretty freaky. But um, yeah, so, so that, um, that model, that predator prey model uh, of early hominins yeah, and, and it also, I, I tried to emphasize this, I don't know if I did, but those early hominins um, were, were quite a bit smaller than, than you know, modern humans. But that predator-prey relationship is one of the other theories to explain why it is that, that you know, hominin brains continue getting larger and more complex and versatile over time. You know, it was tricky business being an early hominin, right, with all those predators around. You know, they had to adapt to avoid being outcompeted by those nearby predators. And so they had to, you know, work together. Um, and, you know, they relied oftentimes, uh, or, yeah, oftentimes on um, a strategy like persistence hunting, uh, persistence hunting, you know, basically exhausting their prey uh, rather than being faster or stronger. And if you've ever wondered why it is that humans are so hairless or furless, you know, whereas uh, the other primates that we see all have, are, are all quite hirsute, um, you know, we are all the prey that they would have been hunting persistently, right, would more rapidly start to overheat, right? Covered in all that fur, not being able to sweat nearly as much as humans. Uh, they can sweat, but not nearly as much. And we're just covered in sweat glands, whereas they, they don't have as many. Um, and so that strategy likely supported the development of more complex cognition because it requires more complex strategies than just like seeing your prey, attacking your prey, eating it, all within a couple of minutes, even if you're working with other members of your of your you know species or whatever your group. Um, so yeah, um, there's a, a lot of different a lot of different story directions that are happening right now all together. I think we definitely need to expand this topic in the future, maybe. Um, but yeah, I mean, I so like another like you you're giving a lot of really good and interesting reasons for like all a lot of different features that we have. Another one that I came across, though, regarding the brain size is that, you know, it's actually just also sort of harder to, to change your brain and head size than it is to change the size of the rest of your body, right? So there's a, another study I found where, um, oh, I don't have it up right now and I don't remember who it was, but it's, there's another study talking about like relative brain size and intelligence. And basically just the brain size can kind of be lagging behind evolutionarily sometimes. So you mentioned like our very, very early ancestors were small and then, you know, they were growing to be bigger. Well, their 
brains might have been relatively smaller just because their brains hadn't kind of caught up with their body size yet. And that's, that's actually one of the explanations too for why Homo sapiens might kind of have bigger brains because we supposedly were, um, our ancestors were, our recent ancestors were bigger and we were in the process of getting smaller perhaps, but our brains, we saw these like big old bobbleheads that hadn't like quite shrunk down yet. So, um, so there can be, I, I always like to highlight like there's, there's good, sort of stories and reasons for things like evolutionary reasons but also sometimes it's just like ah evolution is trying to catch up evolution is not perfect and uh i know ian that we had talked about doing an episode maybe our next episode will be one on this kind of lag of evolution which um, often if you've heard of the term vestigial traits those are traits that kind of got left behind by evolution right things that we still have features we still have um, just because our ancestors had it, not because they're necessarily useful to us anymore. So like the appendix is an example that gets thrown around of this. Um, and it's like our tailbones and things like that too. Right on. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So what else can we learn? So the, we, we talked about our sort of shared heritage that we have with, uh, you know, Neanderthals, Denis uh, Denisovians, uh, and other hominins. And, you know, just like um, the concepts of you know early hominins just being violent and brutish alone, it's it's also mistaken to think that Homo sapiens are entirely distinct and unconnected from our hominin cousins, right? There's a fair bit of interbreeding between hominins, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, and we all carry the legacy of those other hominins within our own genomes, right? They contribute some of the genes that that you know make us who we are today. So again, somewhere like two percent of of um, uh, you know, genomes can be traced back to Neanderthals mating with early Homo sapiens. Something like five percent of Aboriginal Australian Aboriginal population uh, genomes are are composed by Denisovian genes, uh, and a lower percentage, but a percentage nonetheless, of people living throughout Asia uh, and the Americas. Um, and so, uh, John Hawkins, who's an anthropologist at the University of Wisconsin in in Madison, uh, yeah, and, and he 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 makes the same argument that Georgia was making that. Rather than seeing, you know, thinking of us uh, uh, you know, as having like a, a family tree, uh, you know, think of it more as braided rivers, right? All flowing in and out of each other, contributing water here and there. Um, you know, we've inherited genes from a whole variety of other hominins who were sculpted by different selective pressures, different environments, uh, but it is this shared genetic heritage. Um, and, uh, you know, by the way, another thing that I always, you know, find fascinating to, to recognize is that without that interbreeding, it's possible that Homo sapiens could have been become so inbred that our survival could have been compromised, right? It's strange to consider, but humans are actually unusually inbred relative to other primates. Chimpanzees and orangutans, for example, they are much more genetically diverse than humans are, um, and it's it seems like all humans are the byproduct of like a small single tribe that you know, um, which some evidence suggests is the case that made it. Um, and so without Neanderthals and uh, Denisovians, perhaps, including, you know, Dragon Man or, or maybe not, uh, spicing up the genetic pot a little bit, humans, you know, wouldn't have benefited from, you know, some almost certainly needed genetic diversity. And so Hawkins suggests that, like, the ability for humans to adapt to high altitudes may very well have been inherited from Denisovians. And um, more importantly, you know, we might have inherited a more versatile immune system because, you know, those other hominins' immune systems would have been sculpted by the unique pathogens that they, you know, they would have encountered in their unique environments. Um, and so, so yeah, so not only did it just like happen, but it was probably really advantageous for us. Um, and so, so yeah, so so Dragon Man is, is you know a beautiful specimen for sure. Everybody agrees on that, and we're we're gonna have to wait to see how the rest of the field, particularly geneticists and so on, integrate and interrogate this finding more more closely, right? But whether it's a Denisovian or Homo longi. Uh, what we know for sure is it is this echo, right, from our um, evolutionary past. Um, and so, um, so with that, do yeah, you have any one, uh, closing one, thoughts, Georgia? Oh, please. Oh, no, I just, yeah, one, I mean, one thing right right off that is that, you know, one of the articles I was mentioned, uh, someone was saying that, like, you know, I bet that there's a bunch of uh, hominin fossils, not just in the ground, but like also in museums that might actually, now that we have this dragon man skull, it might give a lot of the, the fragmented fossil data we have like 
more meaning. It might help us in interpret some of that other data better. And like once we get, you know, genetic information too, possibly from um, this dragon man, we might be able to see like, oh, these these other fossil fragments actually belong with dragon man. And then and then like that's where like the piece more and more pieces of the puzzle like start coming together. And so um, dragon man could enhance the knowledge of our knowledge of like the fossils that we have already found and just by way of helping things fall into place, kind of. Right on. Um, so, so you know, in closing uh, for me, it, you know, the discoveries like these are, are deeply encouraging to me. Um, I, I'm like a, an optimist when it comes to humans. Um, you know, it's n obviously not hard to find examples of humans doing terrible, you know, doing terrible things to each other, to other animals and, and to our environment. Of course, if you happen to have opened Twitter in the past couple of days, you'll have seen uh, a, a giant burning inferno opening up in the Gulf of Mexico due to things that humans do. Um, you know, it's never a terrible bet to be kind of cynical about humanity, but but humans and, and really humans alone have produced some of the most beautiful, amazing, transcendent things that have existed on this planet, right? We're an incredibly successful species. And we're the descendants of some unusually clever and you know, courageous and creative apes. And um, I still think that, you know, despite all of the human deficits, uh, of which there are many, uh, that are manifest all over the place, um, the, the beauty of, of humanity dominates those deficits. And, and so, you know, earlier hominins and, and apes are, are, you know, worthy of, of admiration and, and appreciation. But, that, um, you know, I'm optimistic that we'll, we'll figure out a way to, to emphasize um, that beauty. Uh, moving forward as we, you know, continue evolving. But um, all right, with that, I'd like to thank Georgia very much for joining uh, joining all of us today. Um, everybody really ought to subscribe to Georgia's channel here on haps.tv. Um, and, you know, I can tell you from experience that it can be a lot of fun to join someone as they're, they're wrapping up their PhD. Um, and uh, so be sure to check out, uh, you know, Georgia's channel. And, um, you know, as, as she was saying, hopefully this will be the, the first of, of several at least topics that, um, you know, we've already actually talked about doing in the future, like the vestigial um, uh, anatomy. Um, yeah, yeah, so, hopefully, um, yeah, some more evolution, cognition stuff in the future for, for me and Ian together. And then if you're like feeling hungry for another skull episode, I had one from a while, a little while back now that was, I guess that skull. So I was working with like some skull data and giving hints on it while people try to like figure out what it is. And so I will, I will leave that on the table for you. That's awesome. I, yeah, and I should also note that I'm going to be interviewing the lead scientist on a study uh, that I talked about on, on the brain basis of creative expression of musicians. Um, and I talked about that, that a couple of weeks ago, um, who himself is a musician here in Philadelphia. So, so that should be fun in, in a couple of weeks. But with that, um, thanks so much for watching, everyone. Um, happy Fourth, if, uh, if that's a thing you celebrate. Um, and um, I will uh, see you next week. And um, yeah, OK, yeah. So thanks so much for everybody. And um, we'll see you next week. Thanks, everyone.